Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's session. Um, I am Professor Jeanette Moritz uh, from UNISA, and I will be journeying with you this afternoon or early evening as we talk about um, writing for publication and assessing in the first part the potential for publication. So tonight's session is the first of a three part session where we will be focusing on writing for publication. So tonight is part one, and then we will look at part two on Wednesday uh, evening, afternoon, and then on Friday we will be finishing off uh, the three part session. So I'd like you to um, sit back and maybe for now uh, listen, but um, I suspect that you will also be working very hard um, in the next few hours as you start thinking about your research and start to also conceptualize your potential for publication. So um, what I aim to uh, do tonight is um, give some of the softer issues um, around assessing the potential and then also get down to the nitty gritty um, to give you some aspects where you can start working and thinking on uh, in the next few um, sessions and that by the end of the week, hopefully, you have a good idea of what you could potentially do regarding publications. Um, so to start off with, we're going to look at aspects such as why would we do it um, and what is in it for us? And then um, how do we go about? So I would like to frame uh, tonight's session in terms of um, conceptualizing that we, as we assess, we are actually busy conceptualizing uh, publications and thinking about publications long before we actually start writing for publications. So tonight, very much um, in a thinking space and a conceptualizing space, but also some ideas of how you can start going forward. So before we start, um, when we do research, you know, there's often a lot of negative aspects that it's hard and it's tedious and some people wonder why they ever do it. Um, and the same goes for publication. Um, publicating, pu publication of our research, of our findings, is often um, so such a daunting process. And very often it's because we're not sure how to go about the process. And um, a lot of people tell us how difficult it is. And um, that make, frames it often in a very negative aspect. So um, before we start tonight, I want to tell you that there are also very pleasurable aspects. And I hope that when you've got some idea how to do it, you will also engage in the process of actually enjoying it. So let's start off with why do we do it and what's in it for ourselves? Um, very important to know is what is the expectation of the university? So when we look at the UNISA documentation, um, when we look at our procedures for master, master's and doctoral degrees, um, we will see in, in the section 5.5.3 um, that it mentions that the value of publication and of parts, very important, for example, chapters of dissertations or theses or co-publication by a candidate and a supervisor in order to receive peer review feedback on original research is recognized by UNISA. It's also recognized that there's a strong tradition of publication of research work by postgraduate candidates in order to build and enhance their academic standing. 
uh, in in their respective research communities and therefore it's recommended um, that both the supervisor and the candidate be, uh, come to a prior agreement on the number and types of publication that emanates from a dissertation and a research and the, uh, and the thesis within the academic um, traditions. Um, and then it's also advised that um, that the the supervisor will be uh, the co-author and that the candidate, which is the student, either master's or doctoral student, will be the main or main author. So in this um, part of the procedures, it's very important that um, that it's recognized that one can publish either parts of your dissertation or thesis or your dissertation or thesis. And uh, we do that to get peer review, um, but also to enhance one's academic standing. But then very important, they tell us that um, we need to come to a prior agreement within the supervision relationship with our supervisor regarding the potential publications that emanate from a master's or doctoral study and that we also negotiate the authorship of these publications. Um, and that has been the case um, up to uh, pretty recently. What has, however, changed is UNISA's graduation expectations, where if you um, uh, started your studies in 2020 and after that, um, the graduation expectations were that on a master's degree level that you will have one publication submitted to a journal. And in the case of a doctoral degree, two publications submitted to a journal. Now that is subsequently changing for from next year where um, they also require proof of these submissions as a compulsory condition for a degree to be conferred. And that's in the case of both doctoral and master's degrees. So it has become a graduation expectation that you will publish. Um, and not just as um, in previous years that it's a recommendation or that it's a nice to have or that they um, agree that this is a good practice. So it is becoming compulsory that you have proof of submission. Now, this is also very important. They require proof of submission. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it had to be published yet before they will confirm the degree in other universities, it might be the case that you need to have it published. But for UNISA's graduation expectations, it's submission of a manuscript. Now, why that is so important is that we need to start early on in our uh, master's and doctoral studies um, to think about our publications. Um, in order to meet the graduation expectations. Um, so one of the take home messages for tonight, and I can't emphasize it enough, is that you shouldn't wait until you have completed your thesis or dissertation to start with a process of conceptualizing and writing for publication. So um, I am uh, tonight I'll largely be speaking about um, publications from a master's and a, a doctoral thesis and not necessarily um, going the route of a thesis by publication. Um, that route would automatically mean that your thesis it consists of a number of publications already. Um, so what we'll be focusing on for tonight is the tr a traditional route of um, doing a master's and th uh, doctoral study um, by research and then potentially looking at publications from that route. So there might be some other motivations um, why, why you would do it other than just the uh, uh, compulsory component in terms of graduation. 
So um, it's it's very often uh, true that a master's uh, dissertation and a doctoral thesis per se is only read by the supervisor or the examiners and possibly never read again. So once you've completed your master's and doctoral um, research, your thesis or dissertation is uploaded to the UNISA repository and it's very unlikely that anyone would ever read it again. Um, and that's a very important aspect why we look at publication um, is that we will we would want our research to have impact and also have uptake um, in the uh, larger research community and that it doesn't only lie on a shelf somewhere and collects dust if it was in the older days. Um, so we want to write something um, that other people would want to read. And very often as you do your research, you discover that there's also something that that isn't there that when you were busy with your research, you would have liked to have read. Um, you could also um, publish um, having a rant now, this is um, something that people won't often tell you, and it's more um, seasoned researchers that often write because they want to rent. And that means that um, you might have a very um, diverse opinion or you're very heretic. And um, I must say, I often enjoy uh, writing when I want to rent. So if there's an issue that I really um, feel very passionate about, um, I quite enjoy writing ranting articles um, and they might be conceptual in nature or they might be a discourse article, um, but that's just something of a personal nature that often uh, people won't tell you they write just because they want to rant. Obviously, there is um, it's deeply uh, um, uh, still scientific. It doesn't mean that it um, doesn't carry any weight, but that's just on the sign. Then you would want to tell others what you thought or what you still think and what your research found. And you want to persuade others to take your findings on board. Um, and that goes back to who's going to read your research and um, having a, a actual uptake of your ideas and findings. So you might ask, uh, are you writing for yourself or are you writing for others? Now, very often, um, if you want to follow a career in academia, um, your publications is your um, your what you have to barter with. So um, other than entry level needing a master's or a doctoral um, degree is that your publications become your capital. It becomes uh, that which carries weight in academia. And um, you've probably heard about the saying, um, if you've been in academia, it's publish or perish. Uh, currently, tongue in cheek, they say publish and perish. Um, so publications is a key requisite for academic advancement. And um, if you are considering a career in academia, it might serve you well to um, start very early on in your uh, research career to start public publishing so that you have that publication record uh, for advancement in academia. Then you would also want to um, gain recognition for your work. Um, you are putting many hours in this and again in the academic context, um, you would want to carve out a position or a niche area for yourself where you can start gaining recognition for your work or a specific niche area or a specific topic uh, of your research. Uh, for those of us who enjoy writing, um, there's a lot of personal satisfaction in um, honing your craft in um, writing, um, sorting out ideas, setting yourself new challenges. 
and learning how to write on a higher standard. Um, I'm I in terms of writing on a higher standard, I don't mean to necessarily imply that your writing in your dissertation or thesis isn't of a higher standard, but that public publication requires um, more refined uh, academic and scientific writing. Uh, in a dissertation, you have about uh, 75 to 100 pages to uh, write what you think. Uh, in a thesis, you have up to 200 or 250 pages to write what you think. Um, so your opportunity uh, when writing for publication um, requires more concise writing. You are now looking at other criteria such as uh, journal criteria. Um, you are looking at finding a very niche uh, area and contributing. So um, your writing does by virtue imply maybe a higher or a different standard of writing. Um, you are now not just trying to um, obtain a master's or doctoral degree, um, but you are now vying on either a national or international stage um, where you are uh, satisfying uh, scientific criteria in order to get a voice, um, an academic voice, either uh, in in uh, nationally in publications or even on a national international stage. So um, those are very important um, uh, considerations and um, why you might want to endeavour. Uh, then on a more um, uh, uh, social value level, um, I am sure that we all want to contribute to knowledge. And if you are doing a PhD, you have to contribute to new knowledge. Um, you want to build your institutional status. So remember, you are all affiliated to UNISA um, and your publications contribute to UNISA's institutional status um, and also the university status among other universities. So universities are ranked according to their research output and your output then could contribute to building um, the UNISA uh, research um, brand and also their research strategy. And then you would like to uh, maybe start developing a research profile. So the picture that I've got on the screen is my Google Scholar research profile. And um, these profiles, there's many others. There's Google Scholar, but there's also a number of other um, profiles. Um, and as soon as you start publishing, you can start to develop uh, a research profile that would also have a footprint um, on, on a number of platforms. So I think um, my biggest delight one day when I Googled myself, I don't know if you do that, um, but it's maybe a good idea that you start Googling yourself, that you can see what is it what is out there about yourself. But the day I googled myself and the first thing that came up was my name and next to it was researcher. I knew that I had achieved um, the objective to, uh, to develop a research profile and to establish a research profile. So um, it's quite a serious endeavour and it's a long term endeavour. Um, so start early. I'll keep on saying that the earlier you start uh, with your research profile through publications, um, the longer term you have to establish yourself and to establish a research profile. All right, so those are more on the softer issues. So let's now start on um, the nitty gritty stuff and where you can actually start um, thinking about your own research. So um, when, when we start to decide what we want to uh, publish, the very important aspect is what merits publication? What in your dissertation or thesis merits publication? 
So um, a very important note is that um, it's not a random affair. Um, you would seriously need to consider what in your dissertation or in your thesis has merit. And we will uh, talk about um, the how do we measure merit um, as we go along. But very importantly, it doesn't mean that once you've done your dissertation or thesis, that that by itself merits publication. Um, thinking about your publication, um, it needs another uh, strategy of thinking and conceptualizing. So if you've thought about your um, dissertation, even while you are busy doing it or your thesis while you're busy doing it, keep in mind the whole time and ask yourself, does this chapter merit publication? Does this thesis or dissertation merit publication? You will often find that once you've submitted your uh, thesis or dissertation for examination, one of the criteria that the examiner needs to tick off is they need to answer the question, or is the thesis or dissertation um, uh, does it have uh, potential for publication either as is or in a in a um, in another form? Or, um, so they might tell you in your in your examination results that yes, um, there are publishable parts or it's publishable probably more on a master's level um, in 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 a, a whole format. But say you've now got confirmation, hopefully before the examiner tells you this, um, we, we now need to see how we can adapt our work for publication. So it's very, very seldom that you will find that you can publish a dissertation or a thesis as is. Um, we need to uh, adapt our work for publication for various reasons. But say in in um, you you know that there is a part of your dissertation or your thesis um, that can be adapted for publication. Let's see in broad strokes um, how we can start the process going. So um, first of all, what is very important, um, we'll talk about how you can identify parts and aspects, but very importantly, very early on, um, you would need to start targeting a journal. And that can be as early as your proposal phase or once you've done your literature review. You might find, for instance, that um, as you do your literature review, you find that the key authors that you are citing all publish within a specific journal. Or you might find that um, a specific journal that you have discovered through your literature review um, uses a or publishes a specific methodology that you are maybe also using or contributing uh, to. And you might start um, thinking about targeting that journal. It's also helpful to start thinking about uh, targeting journals uh, as early on as your literature review. The reason being is that um, when you start targeting a journal early on, you start getting used to the discourses within that journal, what they publish, um, what the publications look like. Um, you could potentially, by the end of your literature review, also start identifying gaps um, in that specific uh, for, uh, field, for instance. Um, so very, very good idea is to very, very early on in your research, identify the top journals in your field. Um, and start reading in those journals because that also already starts preparing you for eventually contributing uh, to that journal or publishing 
in that journal. So while you're doing your literature review, often we say, you know, um, you can have a catalog of uh, what authors are you citing, what, uh, what methods are they using, what is their um, conclusions or their findings. But very importantly, I would suggest early on already, also then adding in your catalog, which journal they're publishing in, what are the journal guidelines, and we'll speak about that a bit later, um, so that you can already start getting a sense of uh, top journals that are speaking to your topic or already speaking to your methods or a journal which you would like to um, start contributing to the discourse. So this you can do very, very early on in your, in your studies. It's very important that you pay close attention to the journal's aim and scope, and this you can find on the journal web page and the criteria, and I'll show you an example in the next uh, slide. So you need to ask yourself, does your research fit within the journal and the ongoing debates uh, on the journal pages? And you can only do that by reading within the journal. Notice then whether the article cites anything from the specific journal. If it does, then it suggests that this might be a piece uh, interacting with related existing material. And then very important, tell the reader precisely what it contributes to knowledge in the field uh, or new that's new to the subject. And we'll talk a bit about that later. So I'm just going to give you an example of what it looks like um, when you go to a journal's homepage and what the aims and the scopes might look like so that you can get an idea early on of what might be published in a journal. This is an example of a herd. Um, it's the Higher Education Research and Development. And in their aims and objectives, they say that this journal informs and challenges researchers, teachers, administrators, policy makers, and others concerned with the past, present, and future of higher education. So now you already know that if your, um, your research focus area is within higher education, then this might be a journal for you. We also now that know that in this one sentence, they will also look at issues, past, present or future issues in higher education. So you already have one criteria that you can decide whether your research would, for instance, fit in this journal. Then they give us examples. They say that this journal publishes scholarly articles that make a significant or original contribution to the field of higher education. So if you are possibly a doctoral candidate or postdoctoral studies um, and the, you have a significant original contribution, then in higher education, then this might be a journal for you. And they now tell us that they will also accept empirical, theoretical, philosophical and historical articles. Um, so this is quite a wide scope. So for instance, um, I've written in this journal a conceptual article um, and that fell under a theoretical article, but I've also written a purely philosophical article in this journal. I've also written a ranting article in this journal. And so the reason for me um, choosing this journal, other than that it's a rated journal, um, is because they consider such a wide range of um, types of articles. And then they welcome research that interrogates challenges and reflects on pressing issues in higher education. Uh, and what's also nice that they tell us that they would consider a range of theoretical and methodological frameworks. Um, but what they are telling us that it must have a fresh critical insight. Um, and another very important issue is it must appeal to an international audience. 
So we've got a lot of information that we can now evaluate our research on um, in terms of the criteria for uh, herd uh, journal. Uh, so what they are also interested is in is that they look at conversations around higher education and topics over time. Um, what's very interesting in this journal is that they look very favorably on you uh, citing authors that have also published in this journal. So um, just in this short few lines of the journal um, aims and purposes on their website, you can already um, start um, deciding whether this journal is potentially um, something that you might earmark for, for, for various reasons. So um, please have a look when you are considering journals. Um, for now, um, what is their aims and scopes? Because that might already tell you where you could potentially uh, focus your research on. So having said all of that, let's have a look at the potential strategies now that you could um, consider for, for publication and that you can start assessing your work, whether it um, can be adapted for publication. So there's two broad strategies. And the first strategy is a multi-paper strategy. And the second strategy is a conversion strategy. Now, the first um, strategy, uh, multiple paper strategy, is exactly what the word says. It means that you are able to extract from either a dissertation or a thesis more than one paper. Um, and we'll go into more detail now. The conversion strategy means that you convert uh, your current dissertation or thesis as a whole for a publication. Um, but let's start with a multi-paper strategy. So in the multi-paper strategy, um, it would be a good idea to conceptualize your chapters from the beginning, keeping a publication in mind. Um, and that means that um, when we look at publishing um, an a article, usually the publication limit is around five to seven thousand words. Now, five to seven thousand words, five thousand words gives you approximately, uh, say, about 20 pages. Now, a, a chapter in a dissertation or a thesis uh, and a dissertation could be 20 to 30 pages and a th thesis may be slightly longer and your findings may be a bit longer than that. But you can see that if you work carefully and smartly um, and you start conceptualizing your chapters from the beginning as a potential publication, you can start thinking and conceptualizing your chapter for publication and having a specific focus. So, um, and then you could start writing up your chapter, having a um, uh, uh, the structure of a paper in mind. So, uh, a, a publication will typically have an introduction, it will have objective and a purpose, it will have a method and it will have findings. So, um, your literature review, for instance, um, could follow this exact um, uh, formula. Or you can already uh, have your uh, literature review chapter as a systematic literature review or a rapid review, and that on its own could be a standalone chapter. So, um, very, very good idea is if if you can have in mind already from the beginning um, that your chapters could potentially um, be standalone um, research publications. So let's delve a bit deeper into um, what you could consider um, 
contributions or which parts of your research you could potentially target for publication. So a very important uh, consideration is that each publication needs to make a contribution. So if you are thinking about using your literature review, for instance, as a publication, then you need to already from the beginning start framing what is the novel contribution of your literature review. Um, what about it makes it makes uh, maybe a novel contribution? What about it is new? What about it maybe addresses a gap? Um, so that from the beginning, you already start thinking about what is a novel contribution. Some of your original research questions might be a suit, might be suitable for publication. So in most cases, a, a dissertation or a thesis has more than one research question. So in a multiple paper strategy, you might conceptualize um, your research question as an article and each research question could potentially be a standalone article for publication. So, um, but that would then mean that each research question um, has a unique or a novel contribution or is worthy of publication on its own. So think about your research questions and could um, the question, the method that you use to address the question and the findings and conclusion about your research question, could that potentially be harnessed for a publication? And as I've mentioned before, your literature review chapter uh, might have potential potential and then you know you could also if it's just a, a traditional literature review and there is potentially a unique contribution or if you did a rapid or systematic review there's definitely potential for publication. Just a note on systematic reviews. Um, you, uh, if you don't know about a, a, a rapid or systematic review, follows a very specific um, methodology and it also follows a very specific criteria for writing up these reviews. And um, I have discussed that in full when I presented the presentation on a literature review. So uh, maybe just look back to, to those um, uh, slides as well. But if you are, um, um, I've just had about three journals where the editors have written letters that they are specifically looking for systematic reviews. So if you can, if you're in the beginning stages of a uh, specifically um, more in a thesis, um, that you can start with a systematic review, um, that is in high demand at the moment. So editors of journals, um, specific um, disciplines such as health research, for instance, uh, are looking for um, more refined research and not uh, the same of the same uh, or slightly new nuances. Um, they, they are looking for systematic reviews where we have a bulk of information that we have systematically reviewed and come up with conclusions. Um, you might consider your, your research results chapter or your findings, especially if it tells a very compelling story. Um, and this is a very important aspect that when we consider for publication is that we ask ourselves, does this article or publication tell a compelling story? And this doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a qualitative study, for instance. Uh, numbers can also tell us very compelling stories. So um, keep in mind as you already write your chapters um, that you are uh, telling a compelling story to your reader. Um, when you are writing your chapters, you are writing for the examiner and the examiner is your reader. 
but when you are writing for publication, your reader audience is a lot wider, might be on international level, but you are now read, uh, writing for a different reader audience. And if it's not compelling, um, they won't read it. So think about um, your potential publications that they tell a compelling story or they have a compelling conclusion or that they address a compelling uh, subject of, of the types. So um, you might also look at, um, for instance, you know, it, within the national development uh, goals, um, for, for instance, um, uh, mental health has, has come up uh, during and uh, post COVID, for instance, as a very hot topic, very needed as well. But um, it's it's um, a topic, for instance, that is quite compelling at the moment and many stories very compelling within that narrative as well. So um, think about what are current hot topics um, where you could potentially contribute to a wider conversation. Um, you might find that um, they are, once you have written up your findings, um, that some of your findings are maybe a bit ambiguous and um, that could do with some further investigation, for instance, with a bigger sample size or a different theoretical lens. So it doesn't mean that everything um, that ended with your research and there you could potentially also, you know, if you've done a quantitative study, do a different set of um, analysis on it, for instance, or qualitative studies. Um, look at combining uh, uh, different lenses if you haven't already done so in, in your current research. So there's a number of um, aspects that you could consider for uh, potential publications. So just to wrap it up, look at your research questions, uh, look at your literature chapters, look at your findings, um, any novel contributions. And then something that people don't often, con often consider is that you could write up your methodology um, as a pump publication. So if you've used a unique methodology or if you've got unique samples or examples um, where your methodology is novel or different, um, then your even your methodology chapter could be a, a potential publication. Um, so last year I um, wrote a article on using um, uh, drawings that um, adults drew um, and initially I collected these drawings just as an icebreaker. Uh, when I conducted interviews I asked participants to um, draw, draw uh, what they thought of, of supervision. Um, and then later on when I I looked at these drawings um, it, I included it in the analysis, but I argued then later on that these drawings alone could stand as a standalone um, method of data analysis where previously, for example, drawings have been used with interviews. Um, and in that publication, I argued that these drawings could stand alone. And this is the methodology that I followed, and this is um, how I executed it. So in that um, uh, article on, on research methods, for instance. So there's quite a number of avenues where you can um, use a multiple strategy approach to, to um, uh, start with your with your conceptualization of potential um, uh, avenues that you could follow and then um, uh, harness some some uh, publications from that. So um, when we so th that would be your your first strategy. Your second strategy would be a conversion strategy. Um, and in a conversion strategy, you fit your thesis or journal uh, uh, 
in a journal article to fit within the uh, style and scope of a journal. So in this instance, um, you are taking your the entire conceptualization of your masters or uh, thesis and you are lengthening um, that to uh, probably about you shorten it to a third of what you initially had. So from, for instance, 100 pages, you are going to shorten it to approximately 25 to 30 pages. So in the beginning, remember I said your writing changes. So this is quite a skill. Um, how do you reduce um, the 100 pages, for instance, in a dissertation to 25? And I'm going to give you some strategies uh, in a minute. So when we do a conversion strategy, brevity um, is very, very inf uh, uh, important. And we might want to consider narrowing the focus to one objective or one question within your dissertation or in your um, thesis. Um, we want to eliminate certain, you might want to eliminate certain sections or texts in sec sections. Um, and we, you would then look when we consider our abstract um, for a very unique focus. So um, in our conversion strategy, in as much as we are saying that we are adapting the entire thesis or dissertation, uh, we might still need to adapt or, or just focus. Um, so for instance, in a, in a qualitative study, where you looked at the experiences of a certain population and then in your uh, dissertation your second objective was to write recommendations when you convert into a publication you might only want to address one of the objectives um, and then then use that as a as a conversion but i must say that in most cases uh, you can get multiple publications from uh, from a master even a master study so um, although conversion is is a strategy if you keep a mind open on publications from the beginning um, you can potentially always get more than one publication from even a dissertation. Um, but let's have a look at if we did follow the conversion strategy, um, how we might be able to shorten uh, certain sections. So in your introduction section, um, you might now um, pare down your comprehensive literature review to a more concise version for the journal. So instead of having, for instance, a 25 page literature review, you might now um, go down to the absolute um, essence of literature that speaks specifically now to a certain objective and that is not as wide as you might have looked at literature initially in your dissertation, for instance. Um, you might also want to pare down your uh, literature to the immediate context or focus of the journal. So say, for instance, a journal um, looks at um, uh, access to education, um, then you might only focus on areas in your literature review that sp spoke to access to, to education, for instance, and not your entire literature review. Um, you might also now consider to remove content that doesn't directly contribute to the reader's knowledge or understanding of the topic. So very important now um, is that you must keep in mind that your reader is different from your reader for your dissertation or uh, your thesis. Your reader now is, for instance, a international reader that maybe doesn't know the South African context. So for this reader, you might give a background to, for instance, the South African healthcare context or the South African higher education context uh, or the uh, South African um, law perspective, 
where you might not have put that much emphasis in your dissertation or thesis. But now, in order to uh, direct your reader, you might need to uh, focus on these aspects maybe more, uh, where you maybe underplayed it in your dissertation. So uh, in your introduction section, you need to keep your reader in mind and you need to keep in mind what does the reader need to know in order to understand your topic or your paper. So don't assume that um, the reader knows. You need to think about your reader as someone that maybe um, doesn't know the topic or doesn't know your specific focus on the topic. And you need to give them enough information in the introduction section, for instance, um, to cover that baseline. Um, in this section, you can end with a clear description of your question, your aims or your hypothesis of the article topic. Very important. We'll, we'll um, talk about your, your, um, your title um, towards the end, but very important that you need to adjust your question or your aim um, to the article topic, which isn't always exactly the same as your thesis or your dissertation. So your article might, for instance, uh, now be focus, focused on the strategies that you develop to assist primary school learners uh, to read, for instance, where your thesis um, looked at many other aspects. So very important that you are now align your um, question or your objectives to the article topic um, and refine that um, as needed. Your method section, um, please make sure that you provide enough information to allow the reader to understand how the participants were selected, the data collected and analyzed. But now you need to remember you don't have 25 pages to tell the reader this. Um, and I'll show you an example of how you can do this. You probably have about one or two paragraphs to tell the reader this. So what we often do is we refer the reader to previous works that inform the studies method instead of providing full details of every step. But also important that when you've identified a journal, see how much space they provide in the method section um, and see how much information or how they prefer the information to be given. So I'm going to share an example um, uh, with you where the design is described in an article within uh, two sentences. So um, the study is a qualitative, exploratory, descriptive research approach was used in the study uh, as it attempted to explore and describe the ideas, thought and experiences of qualified nurses while mentoring students in the clinical environment with constrained resources. And there's the reference. Um, and this reference would refer to qualitative research and um, why we do qualitative research. Um, this is also referred as being interpretive because an attempt is made to give meaning to concepts expressed by the qualified nurses. And there again is the reference. So instead of unpacking um, in, in 25 pages the design or in 10 pages your, your design, um, here it's done in two sentences, uh, telling the reader what design was followed, why it was followed, and um, which approach it used. So that's just an uh, example for how you could condense um, the design in, in an article. Then also when we look at our results section, um, it might be valuable for you to um, be selective in choosing the analysis um, for inclusion in the research results. Um, you might want to consider only reporting the most relevant ones. Remember, you now don't have 60 pages. 
um, to report on maybe all your results or all your findings. So if you do report or identifying, uh, identify the most relevant results, please now remember that um, if you are deciding, for instance, to only look at the results of, um, for instance, uh, you did your study and you found, let me give you an example of, of a student of mine. A uh, student was looking at um, patients that were admitted in a general ward that had depression. So she has findings around this, but uh, she started collecting this uh, about six interviews were collected prior to COVID and about six interviews were collected during COVID. And there were certain findings that was different um, between the first and the second um, data collection collected. So we've decided to publish an article specifically on the differences pre and post COVID in terms of nurses experience um, working in a general ward with depressed patients. So we are we are not reporting on the full findings of the whole experience or the full findings uh, before or the full findings after. This article specifically now focuses on the difference between the, the two um, lots or two sets of data analyzed and the implications that COVID had for this, for instance. But now you need to go back and you need to now make sure that your aims and objectives specifically now speaks to the difference and not, for instance, um, as her dissertation was um, nurses' experience about this phenomena, but it's now very focused in terms of what we are, uh, what, what findings we are using. So even the title now will be refined to, um, to suit this objective and the specific findings that we are reporting about now. But having said that, be very careful of bias or omitting certain aspects. Um, so we want to give a full report or we don't want to seem biased. So for instance, in this case, we might give a, a table because there's not much space to, to write in full about everything. So we might just a table um, with the themes of the findings before and after and then tell the reader we're going to focus on uh, this specific aspect rather than uh, um, going about it that we seem to only prefer a certain voice or a certain slant or a certain um, aspect of the research. So what you can do is if you have additional information or, or additional findings that has um, implication, you could include um, these in, uh, in into the article as supplementary material. So journals will um, very often allow you to um, upload uh, supplementary material and um, you can then just refer in in the article to um, see supplementary uh, material for instance and there you could have then a scope of the full findings or a full analysis of the findings um, and do it in in that way then in your discussion uh, section you would need to uh, adapt your uh, analysis and results that you are reporting on. So your discussion section will now align with what you decided you are reporting on or the aspects of the findings that you are uh, uh, um, now this, uh, uh, reporting on. So um, check your interpretations um, that they don't go beyond the findings. Um, so you will see it's very important when we go back to the word adapting. You will con cons uh, consistently need to think about what is the aim and the objective of this publication. 
uh, versus the aim and objective of your dissertation or your thesis. So even in your interpretations, very, be very careful that you don't go beyond the findings. Also note consensus or convergence with previous studies. Um, so keeping the focus in mind of the publication or of the article, um, you can now uh, compare and contrast, for instance, what is the same um, in the specific aspect that you're reporting on um, in your discussion with previous studies or what's maybe different. And um, I'm going to show you a short example again of how you would do this in, in your article. So in your discussion, your previous section was giving findings. This section might read um, the findings confirm that there's a lack of universal descriptions of what clinical mentoring is. And you refer to the um, publication or the research. And this results in clinical mentoring being perceived as practiced differently across different settings. Um, a re reference again, so what we are doing here is we are comparing and contrasting to previous studies in our uh, discussion. And then unclear expectations are exasperated by the lack of policy or protocol directives regarding mentoring in the local context, uh, leading to uncoordinated efforts and support from stakeholders. So in that section, there's an interpretation and then we go back to um, re re uh, comparing to previous results um, in that this author said that standards regarding the practice of clinical mentoring um, can only be maintained if it's regulated. So, for instance, um, in, in a paragraph, uh, we can uh, uh, compare and contrast to previous research um, in a very shortened um, version than what we might have had space or allowance for in our uh, dissertation or in our thesis. Then lastly, um, when you are uh, con doing a conversion strategy, then very importantly, um, you will need to um, look at your references and make sure that you are now only including the references that you have um, in the article and not all the reference, for instance, you know, that you had in your dissertation or in your thesis. So the reference section needs to be reworked um, and contain the most pertinent references. Then also please have a look at the journal guidelines. There are some journals that might tell you that you can only have 30 references. For instance, they cap um, the amount of references that you that you may use. So in that instance, you would need to be very judicious in terms of what you decide to um, reference and what not. So please have a look in the journal guidelines if there is a cap on the number of references that you can use. Um, and make sure that your tables and figures are essential and not does not reproduce the content provided in the text. Um, this is a very, very important aspect because of the page limit uh, and the number or the word limit that journals give you. Um, it's the, the uh, editors don't want to see a replication of information, so if you have given information in a in the table um, that needs to be able to stand on its on its own and speak on its own um, and they don't want to see a replication or a re, uh, or that it's reproduced in the content as well so be very judicious in terms of tables or figures or use tables and figures um, maybe instead of words to convey um, results, findings or comparisons. So uh, using tables is often um, a, a way that you can communicate quite a lot um, without um, uh, maybe uh, imposing or, or uh, stretching your word limit. Some journals might say or give you an indication that uh, certain tables um, you, uh, the signs of the tables, uh, they'll also tell you that a table would, for instance, be equal to X number of words. 
Um, so I think the message that I'm giving you is that it's incredibly important to read what the uh, journal requires of you, not just in terms of what they will publish, but please, it's very, very important that you read the journal guidelines explicitly. If a journal tells you that the maximum article length is 5,000 words, and you submit an article, they will tell you including or excluding references, so make sure about that. But if you include an article that's 5,001 words, um, it might be rejected immediately. Um, so it won't even go out for review. Um, and please believe me that it happens. Um, in my early days, I thought, man, 5,000 words is the approximate thumb suck value. I submitted something with 5,003 uh, 5, words. They immediately sent it back um, and told me it's rejected because the, it doesn't meet the word count limit. So please, um, when you look at the journal guidelines, make sure what the word limit is um, and whether it includes references tables and stick to that. Don't take a chance. They do uh, reject um, even on such matters. It's not a it's not something that's negotiable. So when you read the, the guidelines for authors that you can find on any journal page, um, look at the specific requirements of the journal. They will tell you whether you need uh, double spacing, whether they want it in single spacing, whether they want the pages numbered, whether they want the lines numbered. Um, they will tell you if you need to um, use Arial or New Time Roman. Um, they will tell you what the margin settings might be in some cases. They will also tell you what reference technique they use um, and they will reject it uh, if you don't use that referencing technique. So you might find that other than just checking your references with what you have um, in your article, you also need uh, very often to adapt your referencing technique to the journal guidelines. So um, it's very, very important that you please look at the article guideline for authors on their web page and follow those guidelines exactly. You don't want to have an amazing article that's rejected um, due to technical issues. Um, uh, in the in the next sessions, we, we will um, discuss issues of writing, rewriting. Uh, we will discuss how you manage uh, feedback and so on. Um, but for now, start to think about um, the, the journals, um, start to read what their guidelines, for instance, is um, and what uh, uh, topics or what aspects they cover. But we'll talk about your homework in a second or two. Then lastly, you might find it very surprising that um, I've got the issues around the title last, but I hope that you'll understand my reasoning for this is that um, you might revise your title up to the end. So as you are conceptualizing and writing your, your um, article, for publication. It might go through various iterations and you might refine it uh, up to the very end. So um, you might have a tentative title um, to start off with. It might be the same as your dissertation um, if you are using a conversion strategy or it might change uh, according to what you start to focus on or what you uh, what you um, decide to publish in terms, for instance, like your findings. So um, verify that first of all, your title conforms to the standards uh, and requirements for the journal. So the journal will uh, very often also tell you that there is a limit to the words that you can use for the titles. They might tell you um, very often it's limited to 15 words, for instance. So if the journal tells you the title is a maximum of 15 words and it includes or excludes spaces, then 15 words it is. 
um, and you might need to refine your, your title accordingly. And I'll also tell you, for instance, um, the abstract needs to be 150 words or 250 words. They might also tell you that you need to have certain headings in your abstract, um, or they might tell you that the abstract doesn't have headings. So please then don't, if they say they want 150 words for the abstract and they don't want headings in it, then don't give them an abstract of 300 words with headings in it. They, they um, are at liberty to tell you immediately it doesn't um, uh, uh, follow the guidelines. So um, please look at the character limits and the space limits uh, of the journal. Um, and very important, remember that the title um, is often um, what catches the reader's attention. So um, try to catch the reader's attention with a descriptive phase uh, that either conveys the purpose of the research efficiently or that will capture the reader's attention. Um, you often in the social sciences, you might get titles that um, uh, very creative. Um, I just I'm thinking of a title now um, on the deck of the Titanic. Now that might seem like a very catching title, but it doesn't tell us what's the purpose of the research. So if you have creative articles and like me, you like playing with words, um, it might be nice, but it might also bite you in the butt. Um, so um, be very careful. What's usually a good um, idea is that you use your critical key view, keywords in your title to also increase the discovery of your research. So the the the, the secondary um, uh, uh, thing about um, being an academic is. The first, you would like your research published. The second thing is that you want uh, people citing your research, so it's a citation game that you play. But if your research isn't discoverable or isn't able to um, uh, get readers, um, then your research might be published, but also still not read. So your keywords is very, very important. Your journal will also tell you how many um, and in what format that they need to be, but in your title, please try and have your critical keywords so that your research is discoverable. Um, also, when you are looking at international um, research, please make sure um, that the keywords that you use is um, discoverable in any context. I'll give you an example. Um, I publish quite a lot on postgraduate supervision. So if I've got postgraduate supervision in my title um, in the United States, they don't talk about supervision. They talk about advising. So if I have um, someone in the States um, investigating uh, postgraduate supervision in their key term search, they might put in uh, advising and not supervision like we do. So when I have my critic, my 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 keywords um, and I used uh, postgraduate supervision in my title, in my keywords, I will add advising um, just to make it more discoverable for an international audience. Um, internationally in South Africa, we talk about um, chancellors of the university or vice principals or um, as the leaders of our in university institutions. But in the USA, they might refer to principals or uh, a different name. So if your focus um, part or your participants were in the South African context called um, by a certain name, it might be different in other countries. So um, please uh, think about issues like that when you are focusing on international audiences and make sure that your keywords also um, attract uh, a wide readership in, in different audiences and that it includes that. 
Um, so often that uh, that comes with with oh, in my case it came uh, after years of wondering why certain citations were lower, and then you know I only later discovered, but it's called something else in in other countries. So um, that's the end of my formal presentation for tonight. Um, I've I've taken a broad view um, in terms of assessing potential so that you can start thinking about um, your your research and your publications. So um, I'd like to give enough time um, that they, that you could maybe um, also ask some uh, questions and that we can take time to to look at those. Um, keeping in mind that um, we still have another two evenings to go. So if there are burning issues, uh, you're welcome to also add them in the question and answer section and we'll have a look at that if we don't answer them tonight and there's enough uh, to warrant specific discussions. I'll keep that in mind for for the next two sessions as well. But what I um, have planned for the other sessions is that um, for your homework, I'd like you to start thinking about um, a specific uh, uh, title or a topic for for a publication that's either um, a con con uh, where you convert your doc uh, dissertation or your thesis or where you would like to venture to adapt a certain chapter, for instance, from your thesis and dissertation, and maybe have that ready for an example or a discussion next week. Um, so next week, I'd, I'd like you to, in the few, next few days, start thinking. So we're very much still in a thinking space, but from Wednesday on, we're going to start um, looking at the nitty gritty of writing, um, also, uh, but finer details in terms of uh, what editors look for, uh, what they, what upsets them, and what uh, uh, enhances your chances for publication. Other than that, that we've ex uh, looked at now, we'll also look at aspects of how do you. Um, attract a reader in terms of your abstract, uh, some strategies in terms of uh, reading and writing, also looking at how to, to deal with uh, rejections, how to rework articles, but hopefully you are in the good hands of your supervisor as well that um, you are able to conceptualize and, and get a home run uh, in the first instance. But we all get reject rejection letters. I still get them. It hurts a lot. Um, and we'll talk about some of the softer issues, how to, to deal with, with other aspects of academic publishing in the next sections. So um, if you will just give me a, a second or two, I'm going to um, stop sharing and um, I just want to go to the question and answer sections and then we will have a look. Um, so just get me, give me a moment. Um, let's just see. So um, please feel free um, to now um, have your questions. Um, very important. Uh, Question that's coming up now. What about self plagiarism? Plagiarism. If you structure every chapter in this paper way, how would you uh, avoid uh, plagiarism? Self plagiarism. Um, I think it's a very, very important question. So remember, from the beginning, we said we are adapting a chapter. Um, so it might not be exactly the same as it appeared in your dissertation. There is adaption uh, and that's the critical aspect. So 
um, you are not copying and pasting directly from your dissertation or from your your literature review. Um, you are adapting and refining it. Um, so um, I'm not quite sure if it's the same with a conversion strategy. How many of the thesis uh, actual writing stay the same or are you rewriting those? Parts with different referencing. Um, I don't think it's it's as much um, in terms of uh, rewriting and using different references. Um, it's about the focus. What are you focusing on um, when you are conceptualizing or adapting for a article? So some of the re references might stay the same, but um, you have an adapted version of a chapter, for instance, or an adapted version of. Uh, so there might be aspects that stay the same. There might be aspects. So for instance, in a qualitative study, um, the direct quotes, for instance, is going to stay the same, um, but I might only use certain aspects of the quotes. Uh, to align with the specific focus of the study going forward. Um, so yes, we do want to um, be careful of self plagiarism um, and some journal art, uh, journals will ask whether um, the publication is part of a dissertation or a thesis. So they might ask you um, at the end of the, the publication to uh, mention that it's past part of a thesis or a dissertation. And there you can then acknowledge um, that fact, but in in most cases what we want to see as an adapted form and it's not a direct copy and pasting of what you had. So um, it might be adapted in terms of your focus of the article. It might be adapted in terms of what you are reporting on. Um, uh, in terms of when you are looking at a specific journal, that journal focus, the journal guidelines. Um, hopefully it's very seldom that you will actually be able to use your dissertation or your thesis as is. Um, it's It will be an adapted version. Um, and so some parts might be similar, but for the most it's an adapted version and not a copy and paste exercise. So um, I hope that answered the very relevant question in terms of self plagiarism. But thank you for the question. It's it's a very important aspect. And I, you know, I think the very strong message that I'm putting through is that the focus is on adapting. So when you look at the slides again, um, it's not not the idea is not that you copy and paste directly from what you've already done. Um, I'm not quite sure if there are any other questions. It seems for now that um, it is only the one. So um, let's just have a look. Um, it seems that there's one question um, and that we dealt with the self plagiarism and how much of the context says this content stays the same. Um, I'm not seeing it seems that uh, there is a thumbs up and um, that uh, we have dealt with this question. Um, I'll, if there's anyone else that have specific questions at the moment, I only see the, the one question. No, oh, sorry. My camera seems to have gone off again. All right, so um, there's only one question still, so Either I did a pretty good job or otherwise um, you might still be in a thinking space where you are still thinking about what you could potentially harness. So having said that, um, I think just to get back where we started off um, when we started the presentation is that um, this route is, is very important that you co-journey with your supervisor. So going back to the opening slides, um, please uh, involve your supervisor, get their thoughts, their opinions. They should be able to guide you as well. Get their inputs 
um, start early on in negotiating, um, you know, uh, what what aspects might warrant um, publication uh, and you know your supervisor should also be able to guide you in terms of what journals um, that you can have a look at maybe where they've published previously um, so use your supervisor as a source of information um, it it can be a very lonely journey as you know with research as a whole um, but they, they it doesn't have to be so um, start also having conversations with your supervisor if you haven't already um, and talk about have a conversation about publications from early on in your studies already all right um so it that there doesn't seem to be um, any other burning questions. So um, the, the recording is available, the slides will be available, and um, then I am bidding you a farewell for this evening. And um, so what I'd like you to do is please join on Wednesday evening. Think about um, how you have maybe conceptualized uh, a, a topic or a title, from your studies and um, we might have an opportunity to to share those as well or um, if you are thinking of questions um, as as you absorb all the information maybe write them down somewhere and then you're also welcome to post them in the question and answer section when we meet again on Wednesday evening. So from my side, I'm going to bid you a good evening. Hope you're well, hope you keep warm, and then we'll see each other again on Wednesday at the same time. Take care.